This is Selma Schimmel at the annual ASCO meeting in Chicago 2011. And we have the opportunity to speak with key opinion leaders and physicians from all different areas and specialties. And now we are joined by a gynecologic oncologist, Dr. Thomas Herzog, professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, New York City, New York. Welcome. Thank you for having me. At this year's ASCO meeting, there are several uh, research uh, papers, there's data being presented, abstracts involving gynecologic cancers. I'd like to talk about some of them, and in particular, the cervical cancer data, and I'll leave it to you to talk about. I'm wondering if you find it to be a bit controversial. Well, I, I think anything that is a change from what we've been doing for 50 to 60 years is, is controversial. So we, we've been using the pap test for nearly 60 years uh, as the basis for cervical cancer screening. And, and first of all, it's very effective. Um, if, if women get the pap, uh, the chances of developing cervical cancer are extremely low. And we find that uh, in our own country, and we found it in other countries where the PAP is not used, and then you institute a program of screening. And we've been doing the PAP here in the United States annually. That's, that's right, but that has changed also. So there's been a lot of changes. Um, that one of the things that has happened is there's been a marriage with new technologies. So the PAP's a little bit different in terms of how it's processed and how the cells are collected. And the thought is that maybe it's a little more accurate, although it's somewhat controversial. There's some papers that go both ways on that. But the bulk of the thinking is that the PAP may be a little bit more accurate than it was 10, 20 years ago with liquid-based and with the ability of machines now to actually look at it, the specimen and not miss abnormalities. There's discussion about now integrating the PAP with the HPV test right. and then extending screening out to a few years, three years. That's right. What is the foundation's uh, feeling about that and also yours as a gynecologic oncologist? Well, we don't have an official position for the foundation, but I'll certainly speak to my opinion. I, I think it's a step forward uh, in the sense that we spend a lot of resources on, on women who wouldn't, are, are not at high risk. In other words, who come in and get a pap, it's normal, it's normal year after year after year, and they don't have an HPV infection that's clinical. HPV, human papillomavirus, is the root cause of cervical cancer. And in fact, we've divided these viruses into high risk types and low risk types. And the point being that if you have a high risk type, high risk infection that persists, your chances of developing cervical cancer are so much higher than someone else. And so it allows us to follow those women more closely and treat those women before they develop a cancer, which I think is really key. So I think that this is the beginning of using technologies that we will base more in the future on the HPV status than we will the pap test, but that, I think that's still years off. So for the time being, women, are we encouraging them to get an annual pap smear? Absolutely. And how do we get these younger women to know if you're old enough to have sex, then you've got to be responsible, which means going to the gynecologist and having your pap smear? Well, I, I think that's key. And once again, that's a big part of what the foundation does in terms of patient education and awareness. And, and we hope that that's part of the message we're able to get out. The other thing I would mention also is, is, the, is the role for vaccination. Uh, yes. with young women, and I think that's also a very key strategic initiative to try to protect against the most common high-risk type What's viruses. the age, age uh, group that we are talking about? Well, the target group is actually uh, 11 and 12-year-olds, um, and we, we found that there's a really an underuse of vaccination at this time for a number of reasons um, that, that are somewhat complicated. But I, I think that that's a, a, a sad commentary on the fact that we now have the ability to prevent a very deadly cancer, and we're not taking advantage of that great opportunity. So we, we, that's something that we really need to do a better job of in terms of education. Well, in Europe, they're also vaccinating young boys. So I am curious also, how do we raise awareness for our sexually active young men? because right. I don't think it's enough to just educate young women. It takes two, right. and the young men need to be educated. 
Right. Well, the incidence of, of penile cancer from HPV is much, much, much lower than what we see with cervical cancer. Uh, however, the um, uh, genital warts are still fairly common, and in fact, there is an indication for vaccinating males in the United States now for genital warts. Uh, but once again, I think it's all about education with, with males and females, because you're absolutely right. Uh, males serve as the vector uh, in this process. Do you think we're going to reach cancer. a point of vaccinating uh, young boys? That I don't know, and, and there, there's still divided thoughts in terms of the best use of resources and what the impact would be on cervical cancer in terms of a herd immunity. Talk a little bit about the uh, status of, of herpes um, and that issue that young adults who may be listening right. really need to understand because I think that there was an earlier generation where that was more actively talked about. You don't hear as much about that amongst young adults anymore. Well, I, I think that um, you're right. It, it has um, not become the talking point it was uh, 10, 20 years ago because it's been supplanted with talk of HPV. It's been supplanted with talks, talk of HIV. Uh, and, and so it's sort of fallen down the list, if you will, but it's still a, a very troubling infection for those that get it. And once again, related to not, not using protection at the time of intercourse. So it's very key uh, that that message gets out. Dr. Thomas Herzog, professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology, Columbia University, College of Physicians and Surgeons, New York. Thank you, Summer. I thank you.